Geologist of Texas and the director of the Bureau of Economic Geology. Um, how many of you may know him best, he has co produced and is featured in the energy documentary film Switch, which has been screened in over 50 countries and has 15 million people have seen it. He founded the nonprofit Switch Energy Alliance, which is dedicated to inspiring an energy educated future. The Switch Energy Alliance creates free, nonpartisan, film-based resources to help students, educators, professional and gener general users around the world learn about energy. He's working on a new film project that will address global energy poverty and energy transitions. His second energy documentary film, Switch On, will be released later this year. We're excited to welcome Dr. Tinker to the OCU campus today, and we can't wait to hear more about his presentation, Sustainable Energy Transactions. Please, transitions, excuse me. Please welcome Dr. Tinker. Wikipedia about sustainable energy. 
and you're Googling and Goku because that's what you want to do. I'll do that now. I'm going to rewind this a little bit. So I'm going to show you quotes, and then we'll talk about some things in there, partly sort of being reasonable. I think some of it less than reasonable if you're looking at it. So if this is a reasonable definition, it's one that's commonly used. Meets the, the needs of uh, future generations of us, I suppose. But I'll start with this one. In general, renewable energy sources, such as solar, wind, geothermal, thermal power, are widely considered to be sustainable energy sources. So that's where it starts. And let's just dive in. Let's see what, it, what they are and where they're going. And I'll, and I'll start with this thought. Given that, most of us actually don't know where electricity comes from or how, or how oil is made. We, we don't. Okay. Most people in the world, the challenge is we think we do. And then everybody votes. So we're all, we all have pretty strong opinions about energy. And, and, and our beliefs about that, and we think we have control of it. So we think we understand these things, but we tell them these things to look for our carbon properties, what that is, what that looks like, and we can maybe play with this, but maybe not to the scale that we want to. So we'll get into emissions and pump standards and things like that. Not this part, we can talk about that another time, but we can never talk about that now. We have to stay here. Start here for me. Nutrition isn't good. Bill looks like a giant. He's about my height, uh, relatively. And, and the, the community center that night, you can see their faces. They really were quite amazed by all of this. And here we are after uh, eight days of work on our crew. Let's move over to Africa. We'll go to Ethiopia to begin. And a different kind of mud hut and thatch roof, but similar strategy. Again, wonderful young kids, but pretty tough, pretty impoverished if you see the clothes and legs and scabs and wounds and things. They're doing something different. It's not solar panels. They're building a huge dam on the Ethiopian-Sudanese border that Ethiopians are paying for, for the most part. Not much world money. By huge, I mean huge. Here's to scale our own Statue of Liberty. When you look across this, it's more than a mile. That big cr truck is on our side of it. Um, there are 16 400 megawatt turbines, 6.4 gigawatts of electricity that will be generated there. 
and it will power half of Ethiopia, more than 50 million people, and bring, and they'll sell electricity to neighboring, and so they bring in revenue as well. It's changed the balance of power in North Africa. This is on the Blue Nile, which flows north, merges with the White Nile to form the Nile and flows north into Egypt. Egypt has always controlled the Nile. They don't anymore. Ethiopia is controlling its own headwaters. So the conversations are changing. When you start to put that kind of electricity in, they, they had displaced this village from up dam to down dam. And there's a pole there getting ready for power lines, which will then bring electricity. And they've built a school for the first time ever. These young guys that you saw earlier, I was holding kids from, you know, one up, and I just asked them all, what grade are you in school? And the same answer every time, second grade, yeah, because they'd never been in school. So they're all just started in second grade, and they're learning together. This is a centralized grid solution. That dam will produce the equivalent of six nuclear reactors, about 10 massive coal power plants, or 10,000 two megawatt wind turbines, which is all just under what we have in all of Texas. One dam. Keep going over to Nepal, north of India. We see Sanu Kanchi inside her home cooking the way she always has, and her ancestors and ancestors over wood and coal inside. Five kids. She's 36 years old, was developing cataracts. We visited the local hospital. Lung cancer in the women. Um, the kids go there with various kinds of pneumonia and respiratory challenges. It, it was it's tough, you know, tough to see, but good care. They're working on that issue. So they're bringing in natural gas from India, putting it in bottles as LPG. Like, it's like what you cook with your propane tanks and your barbecue pits. And those go into homes now. You can see the old wood stove here and then the LPG tank for the gas top burner and biogas where they mix cow dung and, and human waste to make their own biogas in each home and these new reactors. You'll see me in the film scooping it up and blending a special blend help them make biogas, and finally an induction cooktop that they plugged in. So again, the air in this home is completely different than the one in Sana Conchis. When you cook inside like that every day in a room very small with wood, it's like smoking between two and three packs of cigarettes each day for you and your kids. Okay. So clean cooking is centralized and grid. Uh, back to Africa, to Ethiopia, this is Kibra. It's outside of Nairobi. You see kids here going to school in their uniforms, coming home from school on this day. Not environmentally very clean. Whenever you're in poverty, your environment's awful. Let me just make that link for you real early. Um, but wonderful people. Uh, Kenya Power and Light brought electricity to Kibra, which is the largest slum in Africa. Don't know the population. The, the estimates range from about 150,000 to over a million because they don't know. Metal, corrugated, you can see here, this is church. Revelation, Disciples of God Church, schools that are coming through. The problem is, so they were paying for this electricity with tokens and cell phones, as you go basis, creating credit and, and industry in many ways, but the cartel that lives in Kibra said, well, we're not getting the revenue, so they tapped around all the lines and hooked the wires back up to the metal to ground them and started charging the people for that electricity, which they're stealing from Kenya Power. A little cheaper, so sort of better for the village, but, or for the slum, but when it rains, because of the way the wiring is done, several people a day get electrocuted. And that's not a good outcome. So pretty interesting challenges when you're trying to make things go to scale. Again, there's one of the schools, wonderful kids, I can't, it's hard to describe how, how um, joy-filled in some ways these young people are given the level of poverty they live in. Partly they don't know. But I can say to you, I've been in 60 countries and, and we don't really know poverty here until you start going and seeing it in other places. Not trying to minimize ours, but the relative is stark. Stay in Ethiopia instead of the city, go out to the Maasai, where the Maasai have lived like this again for centuries and centuries. This is one of the nicer homes. A lot of uh, several generations of family live here cooking inside with wood. We brought a, a solar panel, put it on, and lights, one light in each room, uh, a battery to power a charge a flashlight and a radio. And this was the upgraded system, so they got a television. And 
and these little kids, which I'll show you, were watched TV for the first time, and the thing that came on somehow was the movie King Kong. And, and it was one of the more modern, so it's really realistic with King Kong ripping apart something that looked like T-Rex, and these kids' eyes were this big, and I'm like, no, it's not real, you know, they're, they don't, they've never seen this, right? So anyway, uh, here we are, this is one of the couple fathers that lived there, we traded headgear, and that's the, that kind of the matriarch, of the, or the patriarch of the whole uh, family where we visit him, again, wonderful people wanting to trade me his, his uh, knife there for my hat, but I don't think I could have carried it on on the way home. <laughs> Great kids. So what does it mean? What does it really mean to not have much energy? If you look at these places I've just showed you, we went to Ethiopia and Kenya and some other places, on a kilowatt hour per person per year basis, that's what they consume. Might not mean much to you. Relatively, you know, there's my fridge. So I consume nine times more energy with my refrigerator than the average Ethiopian and three times more than the average Kenyan. And I have two fridges. You have to have one for beer. You know. <laughs> Keep it in a very efficient garage. So that gives you a feel for what it means to live in energy poverty and really not have much. And how many people do that these days? a billion people without electricity, and that's come down. So a billion people, what's that look like? This map here is color-coded about a billion per color, plus or minus. So all of North America, all of South America, and throw in Australia is about a billion people. Now, we have a lot of people. When you go around the cities and go to South America, it's pretty dense. That many people don't have electricity in the world today, okay? And then on the cooking side, it's way worse. It's a third of the world, 2.7 billion people cooking without clean solutions today. So you've got to throw in Africa, all of Europe, and the Middle East to get to 2.7 billion. One third of the world living in energy poverty, I would put to you, is not sustainable. We can't continue to do this for reasons we'll discuss. It takes both centralized fossil and hydro and distributed renewables to change this. It, we can't do it all with renewables. We, that's the only solution in some parts. We brought it to Columbia, et cetera. But it's not going to work for slums and, and dense cities in Ethiopia and things like that. You have to have all solutions there. Is it tied to economic poverty? Well, severe poverty across the bottom, three bucks a day or less, against the electrification rate of the country with the size of the circle proportional to the population. Latin America is mostly electrified. 10 to 20 percent severe poverty. Asia, a lot more people, less electrified, a lot more poverty, and then Africa, even more. Okay. Now correlation, causation here, it, let's just say there's a, there's a relationship, a, cause, a correlative relationship, a correlative relationship between poverty and electricity. The, the paradox of all this is energy won't end poverty, but you can't end poverty without energy. So it's the beginning. A lot still has to happen in order for it to end, but that's what the start is. Another way to look at it is GDP per person against electric power consumed per person over a 25-year period by, uh, by countries. The U.S., we consume the most per capita, and we're the wealthiest. For 25 years, we, haven't, we, we've been, we started to reduce our per capita energy consumption. That's a good thing. We're headed in the right direction. We can do a lot better. And doubled the economy. Because we can. We have the systems in place to do that. There are countries that are just rising up this developing. You see Malaysia, South Korea, Russia, and Saudi. Here comes China in orange. They're kind of just getting started. And India hasn't appeared yet. We'll call it undeveloped, even though there's some severely wealth wealthy people there, a lot are not, that's in purple. So you see a trend for sure between access to energy and wealth, or, or economy. 25 years ago, it was this slope, and today, 25 years later, it's a lower slope. That's a good thing. Less energy to grow that economy, but we can do better. We can start to level it out and roll it over. When you get rid of the mostly developed, you end up with about a third of the world again, two and a half billion people living in various states of energy poverty. We made a film, it's called Switch, 
it was uh, about energy. It's the star. So we went where there was energy. Why not? 11 countries, blah, blah. It's online if you haven't seen it, and a lot of other material. What we left out of there, of course, was this group, the, a third of the world who doesn't have much. And they're starting to develop, and they want to go where we are. Energy shouldn't limit that. But it'd be wonderful if they could do it in a different way, grow their energy and kind of come back down here to where they're growing their wealth and we come back down. This is one big component of addressing some of the big challenges of energy and climate and other environmental impacts is how you use energy. We waste so much energy in the world. 60 to 70% of the energy in doesn't get used to do anything. It's just wasted as heat mostly. So what does it do? The things that you would expect, the hunger, the clothing, and, but it also helps with education. If I have a light, I can read at night. Start to get educated in healthcare, you know, refrigerators and other options like that. When I'm educated, birth rates go down. It's a very tight relationship between educated economies and lower birth rates. Instead of 10 to 12 kids, many of whom die, you have fewer children. But even higher level stuff like the the rights and freedom and empowerment of women. It's the women who are getting differentially impacted by lack of access to energy. They're going for the water. They're doing the cooking. They're living in the severe poverty trying to make the homework, okay, doing all the work. This changes that dynamic tremendously. And finally, immigration and migration. You don't leave countries if your economy is growing. There are jobs for you to have. You start to develop democracies and can vote. It tends to change the whole dynamic of that. So migration immigration is from lack of hope to hope, that's the goal, and this changes that. So big things. Energy poverty doesn't just affect them. It affects us all, okay? And in very po positive ways. It's time to power the people. And the biggest thing that stands in the way of this, unfortunately, but not unexpectedly, is corruption at all levels. And corruption exists everywhere, but it's pretty prominent in impoverished nations. The leadership doesn't necessarily want to empower. They say they do, but education means choice, means... And then you come down through the systems and everybody's tearing money out of the, that stream, okay? So that's the, one, of the, one of the great challenges of fighting that. So let's talk about global energy. What's it really look like? Here we are back to our billion per color map. There's my energy uh, color scheme. All my graphs are colored that way. The world's energy mix looks like this, 85% fossil fuels today. Does it vary around the world? Sure. North America, about like the globe, or 20% of the consumption. Europe is similar, a little more gas. You'd think it'd be a lot different. It's not. More topography, more rainfall in South America, so more blue hydro there. Africa has a lot of coal. The Middle East is going to be a shocker, you know, oil and gas. Uh, they got a nuclear reactor they're about to bring online and some solar they're working on. Look at the colors on the map. Red, orange, light blue, billion, billion, billion. Okay, half of that energy comes from coal. Grow and shrink this to be proportional to demand. Half the world lives under that little right color wheel. They get half their energy from coal. Not, not electric fuels, all energy. Half from coal. Has that changed through time? Yeah, it's all gone up. We've tripled the amount of energy we consume in half a century. And you're starting to see some choices across the top. Now, what else has gone up? We have. Population has grown tremendously. UN forecast mid-case about 11 billion people by the end of this century. We're just 7.5 billion today. 1950, less than 3 billion. That doesn't seem like that long ago, at least it doesn't to me. Who consumes energy? We do. This is correlation and causation. That graph exists because we consume it. Now you'll hear, as you'll read in Wikipedia, um, we'll show you this first, 80% of the world lives in Africa or Asia today, four out of every five people. And they consume less than half of the world's energy. The rest of us, the 20%, consume more than half. So that's the challenge to move up that cross plot out of energy poverty into some sort of energy access. Considering 
Considerable progress is being made in the energy transition from fossil fuels to ecologically sustainable systems to the point where many studies support 100% renewable energy. That's a quote. So let's look at some data, because some of you might say that's great. The sooner the better. Let's look at the data. Here we are back to this, and here's the kind of the solar, wind, and water, 100% renewable by some time. We don't know when, but I'm going to give it to 50 years, and there's one model of what that would look like. Solar, wind, and hydro, and 2% left of oil, gas, coal, and nuclear. And then there are people in Congress today saying, actually, we could do it by 2040 in 20 years, and should. How's that look to you? Ambitious, there's a, there's a, there's a kind word. Um, you know, I, I worry that people actually believe that. And they're the same people that need this, and maybe you're them, but let's talk about it. <laughs> yeah. This product contains peanuts. Here's my favorite one of these. Caution, do not swallow. They, they show you what it looks like if you swallow a hanger. <laughs> Just in case you didn't know. Thank you, lawyers. Or hopefully they're not teaching that in law school here. Um, all right, so. What if it was 75% in the next 50 years? How about 50%? That's what that would look like. Maybe it'll just be 25% renewables. And the demand growth in green I've modeled, it's less than most people, they have it steeper, but I think we're gonna be more efficient. So there's 25% renewables in 50 years. That would be called business as usual. Is it? Let's look at business as usual. Any any geoscientists in the room or scientists that use ternary diagrams, these triangle diagrams, they have to sum to 100% wherever you are. So here's all carbon, all hydrogen, methane, one carbon, four hydrogen, uranium, nuclear, and then renewables in the corners. Where have we been in the last 50 years? These are the actual data. Every circle is a year of the global energy mix. So over 50 years, we've migrated away from the carbon toward natural gas and nuclear. This is pre-policies. This is 1965. And so we've reduced carbon, added natural gas and nuclear, and made a little bit of a turn, doubled the renewables. Let's go back to our 75% case, not the, not the 99 or 98, 75%. Where would that fall on this plot? Right here. How about the 25, the business as usual, right here? Well, it's a, actually a faster change than we've done, and it's a turn. That's the BAU case. And here it's shown as a percent. This is the 25% renewables as a percent over a century. And what you see is oil and coal go from 78 to 37%. Natural gas and nuclear double. Renewables go up four times in that case. Look at the left side and look at the right side and ask yourself, if that, is that business as usual? It really isn't. It's big changes, and they're non-trivial changes when you go to scale. 100% renewable energy is not feasible in any reasonable time frame. To talk about it as political, it's not economic or scientific to have that conversation. And it would likely have significant unintended consequences. What might those be? Well, let's talk about it. Let's first ask ourselves if there's enough oil and gas to do that 25% case. And I'm going to move kind of quickly through this, but I think it's important to look. These are all resources, by the way. Hydro, you have to have topography and rain. You have to have sun. You have to have wind. You have to have uranium, oil, gas, coal. They're all resources that not everybody has. Okay? So that's a lot of oil and gas. This is an estimate of the resources for oil in the world just an estimate out in the future, against how much it costs to get them out. To the left of the line is the whole consumption of oil in the world to date. It was discovered in 1859 in Titusville, Pennsylvania. So that's what we've consumed. To the right is what's still there, at least one guess about it. 1,500 billion barrels is a lot, but it's 20% of this. You'd have to produce. Resources aren't reserves. You'd have to produce it. And some of that's going to come from shale. The, the tight stuff. On the gas side, there's the produced and consumed, and 7,200 TCF is a lot, 
about 25% of what you see up here, and a lot of it would come from shale. Now, you led a revolution here, you were part of that in Oklahoma, Chesapeake and others, about going after these shale gas reservoirs, and it was, gas was priced around seven, eight, nine dollars at the time. So a lot of this was, looked good. We can go get it with that price. What happens when you start to produce a lot of something, economists in the room, what happens to the price? You know, supply up, demand doesn't change, price goes down. And you, you read stuff that said, hey, the shale gas bubble has burst, it's over. You can't afford to go after it. What happens when price comes down? What happened to costs? They come down with it, don't they? Because it's dynamic. Ask the service companies in the oil and gas business. And it's not just price and cost. It ends up being technology and demand, things that are cheaper, we want more, we can afford them, and policy. It's all very interwoven. And you have all those colleges here in your own school. I just had lunch with folks from the law school, from the B school, from the natural sciences. It's all here, okay? It's very integrated. Technology is something we always underestimate how quickly it changes. Here's some technology. It's a 1973 Super Beetle. I know and love it because I learned to drive on it and I still own it and it has its own barn. It's a bug barn, okay? Here's the dashboard, which was 1973, it was brand new. It's an AM radio with a tuner for, you know, bass and treble, I don't know why. Uh, an air conditioner, it never worked, and a stick shift. That was a brand new technological car and, and, and then there's my wife's car today. I don't know what it does. You know, I really don't. It'll park itself if you want it to, it heats and cools, you talk to it. It's nuts. And I know I look old to you, but I don't feel old, okay? In that amount of time, that's the technology change. Now, my grandkids, they're gonna go, what the hell is this thing, Grandpa? Well, that's called a steering wheel, you know? <laughs> Why do you have that? Why do the seats even face forward? We just get in our car and tell it where to go. That's happening already. I promise you, my grandkids are gonna have that. Technology changes fast. Why does it matter in the, in the oil and gas business? This is a highly magnified picture of shale. The dark spots are where the oil and gas are stored. They're little, so here's some methane molecules and, and a hypothetical poor throat. It almost goes away, but these are the molecular scale biologists and chemists in the room. Let's do it on something we can understand. Watch what happens to those pores when you shrink them to the size of a human hair. about 200 of them across the width of one human hair. That's where shale gas and shale oil exists. That's why you have to f crack the rock, frack it, okay? That's technology. We've done some big studies at the, where I am at the Bureau at UT. Engineers, scientists, economists, we're looking at these big shale basins in the country. And when I say looking, we're looking at every single well, and that's them for the Bakken so far. Every one of those wells is a horizontal well that's been drilled. Pretty expensive. One, two, three, four million dollars per line on that map. All those colors look like that. The Permian Basin, here we built these really huge 3D cellular models of these basins. So I'm spinning around for you now one of our recent models in West Texas in the Delaware Basin that shows the geology, it shows the distribution of pore systems and the little teeny holes, or at least what we think they look like. It shows the well paths. Look at all the wells that have been drilled and the horizons that are productive. They're mostly in the purple at the bottom and in the blues. Uh, it's, it's a massive amount of data. You talk about big data. This is a multi, multi billion cell model and there's lots of data in each little cell that come from somewhere. If I zoom in on that, look at the colors. There's the well bores in West Texas. Everything that's yellow or orange or red or green has been drilled in the last six years. Crazy amount of activity. The world is focused on this. The dark brown is the real thick stuff. It's more than 2,000 feet thick. How, how much rock is that? Here's the tallest building in the world. And here's somebody sitting on it. 
okay, it's an idiot. <laughs> but it's our favorite idiot. Who is it? Anybody know? It's Tom Cruise. Mission Impossible. Does his own stunts. So picture our hero and solid rock between him and the ground. That's 2,700 feet. It's about half a mile tall. That's how much rock is in the wolf camp. Little teeny pores, but it's a lot of volume. That's the point with shale. And when you scale that back down to where it sits in the world and then look at the red and the orange, those are other shale basins in the world. And not all of them will produce oil and gas. Price, cost, technology, demand, policy, it all matters to whether or not these start to deliver, but there's big estimates for what exists there. So yeah, there's enough. I hate land. Can you train me to be an engineer? You just need a time machine and a brain with its twice as many folds. Maybe I could try geology. That's just liquor and guessing. So <laughs> as a geologist, I'm proud to say that's actually true. Um, but we guess pretty well. So here's our guesses. After 10 years of work with a big team of 12 integrated, the big circle, that's how much is there. That's the natural gas that's in place. The next one is what's technically recoverable. And the little one is what's been produced so far out of the Barnett. And that's how many wells have been drilled, how many could be drilled. Fayetteville came next, same scale, Haynesville, and there's the Marcellus. And the company that's hosting and helps sponsoring all this is drilling in the Utica. And they're in Ohio, sits right here, kind of shingled next to the Marcellus and delivering natural gas. And this, the little teeny circle is all that's been produced so far. On the oil side, the Eagle Ford and the Bakken, and then here comes old West Texas. And that's just the Midland Basin. We didn't put the Delaware in yet, which will double the size of that. 2% of the oil and 3% of the gas has been produced so far. Out of all that work, that leaves 97% of the oil or the gas and 98% of the oil left still to go after technology and all the other dynamics that go into that. Global gas continues to increase more steeply. The U.S. is the bright red. You can see it here. It's doubled the black line and the red is shale. 60 per, more than 60% of the gas in the U.S. is from shale. And there's the different basins with the Marcellus being the green one. Now on the oil side, again, the light green is U.S. On the global picture, global oil continues to go up. It has not peaked. U.S. has doubled. 60% comes from shale. Okay. And there's the basins, with Permian being the big one, Bakken and the Eagle Ford shown there, and others too. As a result of all that, we thought we had peaked in the early 70s and we're slowly coming down, but in fact, we're at a whole nother peak somewhere into the future as yet unknown, which means we're importing about less than half of what we used to import of oil here. Different politicians take credit for this. They have different terms for it. It's called ener energy dominance now, whatever. Let's talk about what that does with carbon now and other emissions. Look. There are, there are people in the world today that are passionate about climate change and believe it's the most important issue of our time. We need to know what we can actually do about it. Okay, So that's what I want to talk to you about, and it'll probably push some buttons. But what can actually be done about CO2 emissions? Where do they come from? Let's know that first. Well, they come from industry, and these are proportional to the numbers here, transportation, they come from heating and, and somewhat cooling things. A big piece comes from making electricity, which is growing. And then they come from agriculture and forestry and land use. We all make CO2. Everybody who does, everybody alive makes CO2, okay? Even vegans, <laughs> as you can see from the green, okay? But we focus on this, the power sector. So what does that look like? Who makes the most electricity by country? China. Who's next? Us. On down. Who's third? Who's, where's the gap? Wh who would you expect to be in there? Trick question, sort of. It's the IT sector. Makes more electricity, uses more than any nation on earth, except for us and China, and it will pass us. And just, you know, look around if you don't believe me. Um, 
Everybody is on their devices. I took this picture at a soccer game, my daughter's. We're all heavily focused on the game, I promise. Uh, good parents that we are, the pets are on them. You know, look, how often do you charge your cell phone? You know the cloud? It's not a cloud. <laughs> Huge demand centers. Bitcoin. Massive electricity demand. We're going to go down this electric vehicle road? Get ready for batteries and charging, okay? So where does it come from and who uses it by region? It turns out North America and Europe have flattened our electricity consumption for two decades. Asia hasn't. Asia's just getting started with their consumption. And these other parts of the world, you see a kink there in the demand. Actually, the other parts are pretty, oops, pretty narrow, okay? Just getting started. Now, Wiki says, increasingly effective government policies support investor confidence and these renewable energy markets are expanding. Let's take a look at what expanding renewable markets look like. Because that's a true statement, but let's see what it means. Where does our electricity come from? Same data, color differently. It comes from coal, oil, and natural gas a lot. Those are the fossil thermal plants where we get a lot of the grid electricity and some of that kink is taken up there. Nuclear and hydro make a big chunk of the rest. Here comes solar, wind, and then the ge all the biomasses, geothermal biomass. And they're growing. You know, they're getting bigger on the right end, about 8% today. Coal, we built on. Germany built on, Europe built on, China built on coal for power. We, but we've rolled over. We got wealthy and have other strategies now. And so our coal consumption is down, but not in Asia. And those power plants live 60, 70, 80 years. So we have to think about what can we actually do to reduce CO2 emissions at the scale needed. And then the other parts of the world don't use much coal yet. Here's solar. Look how steeply it's grown. It's remarkable. And when you hear solar energy is growing faster than any other form of electricity generation, it's a true statement. It's growing faster. And you hear the prices coming down. That's a true statement. The panel price has come way down to, you know, sub three bucks, not a lot of headroom. So to make the panels and the steep growth are true statements. On the wind side, wind is growing really steeply. We're putting in a lot of wind. Good old Texas has the most wind and hot air <laughs> of any state around, uh, okay, by three times. But, but what's missing? What's missing from these statements? Here's the electricity growth, and there's wind. And yes, remarkably steeper. Watch this. The guy in the truck bed is helping a lot, huh? <laughs> now, why do I show you that? <laughs> Intentions are good. Maybe even contributing a little bit. What's missing with wind? What's the word I'm looking for? Scale. Watch. Remember, wind is this second bright yellow thing. That's the steep growth, and that's what we're doing in the world, just in electricity. Fully renewable in 10 years? 20? Emissions from all this look like this. You might not know this. In North America and Europe, we've been flat and are decreasing. We've been flat for 40 years in our CO2 emissions and are decreasing now because per capita. Who's going up in emissions? Asia. Bad Asia. <laughs> I can't believe Asia makes so much CO2. Don't they know the climate's changing? What do we get from Asia? Everything. <laughs> Everything. We import you know, the other countries, by the way, aren't much, so, but Asia's making half of the world's CO2 emissions. We import everything. We basically 
have shifted manufacturing over there. So has Europe. It's cool, though, because now we don't emit. 100% clean. The California model. What are we really doing? What, what are we really shipping to Asia? CO2 emissions. Not literally, but they're putting them up. Who has better environmental regulations, us or Asia? It's a wonderful shell game. Don't blame Asia. They make products for the world. How about EVs? Now, vehicle sales in the emerging economies, Brazil and Russia had some tough years. Here comes India. They sold a million a year, two and a half million a year in just over a decade. India, same scale against us. We're at 17 million, so is the EU. Recession mattered, sold less cars and trucks, back up. Who's missing here? All together now. At China, 5 million to 27. And rising, the what recession? You know, got steeper. India has the same number of people as China, just less, 20 years early. Guess what they're going to do? Likely. Okay? So, what are EVs going to do? Well, I love these forecasts. Bloomberg said in 2016, we're going to go from essentially two or three million to 420 million by 2040, in the next 20 years. A year later, they said, now it's going to be 520 million. Okay? OPEC said, no, it'll be 40 million. <laughs> they have a different driver. But a year later, after Elon visited, uh, 280. They changed for some reason from 40 to 280 million electric vehicles. Exxon said 70, and then they got exuberant, went to 100. And then the IEA here, so here's, I didn't have any accurate numbers, just made this one up. Studies have shown accurate numbers, aren't any more useful ones you make up. How many studies showed that? 87. So <laughs> here we go. Here's our, here's our uh, tightly bound forecast. Numbers matter, right? So according to Bloomberg, if we were going to electrify 10% of the vehicle fleet, how many vehicles are in the world today? About 1.2 billion. Okay, so electrify 120 million of them, 10%, 120 million, it will take till 2030, according to Bloomberg, which is the most aggressive. And that's 10 million new a year, and we make 1 million a year today. So in a decade, we're going to go from 1 to averaging 10. Probably not. Some people believe that. And then Exxon on the other end say, no, it'll take till 2043, and that's 5 million a year still. And that's going from 1 and point something million a year to 5 million average between now and then. And that's 10% of the fleet, and it's a non-growing fleet, which actually it is growing. So these numbers matter. When you read stuff about it, think at least about, well, what, what goes into that? And, it's, and when, you read, when you read 5 million, don't read 5 million batteries. How many batteries are in an, a fully electric vehicle? Anybody driving the, a Tesla? I wish I was. It's a wonderful motor. Tesla S, the nice sedan, or fancy one. 7,200 lithium ion batteries in one car, all across the bed, the size of your cell phone. 7,200 times 120 million. I can't do math very well, but I'm approaching a trillion new batteries for 10% of the vehicles, and they have to be recycled and reused or disposed of. Where in the hell are they going to go? I know when you throw your cell phone away, you go dutifully to the cell phone disposal center and say, oh, here's my used battery. You don't pitch it in the garbage can, right? <laughs> Neither do I, right? <laughs> How do we consume electricity? Well, it used to be industry, residential, commercial. There's the vehicle part. It's that little yellow wedge, transportation. We haven't started yet. But if it grows, we get ready. And batteries have to be made. And what are they made of? Stuff we mine. What kind of stuff? Cobalt and lithium and other stuff. That has gone way up recently just for our cell phones, not for our cars yet. A trillion car batteries is a lot different than a couple billion cell phones. Here's the stuff. The massive materials for solar PV, 
in tons per terawatt hour in hydro, wind, geothermal, and nuclear, which is really dense. It makes electricity with really dense thing, uranium and thorium, so you don't need much stuff to make a lot. That's important. When we're thinking about environmental impacts, we have to think about all environmental impacts. Renewable energy is not expanding at the pace required to address climate change. It's not. And, it, and it's not ecologically sustainable. Now, you won't hear that anywhere else. And you might not ever hear it from me again because I usually get death threats after I say it. Yeah. Why do I put this up here? Climate models say we have about 10, 20, 30 years, depending on which ones you look at. We're not going to, you can't get there emissions wise with renewable energy. It just won't scale fast enough. We have to get the CO2 emissions out of somewhere else, okay? And then we aren't really talking about the impacts of that. How about carbon prices? Will it help? Intentions are good. These are all the countries in the world that have initiatives around carbon pricing. Some of you may be involved with some of these. The big ones are China and India and the EU and the US. Where we go, the world will follow and we have a huge impact. So let's see how it's working. China, yes. India, no. EU, yes. US, no. Here's the actual change in CO2 emissions in 2017. Increase of 120 million tons, blah, blah. And then the largest increases, the largest reductions. China went up the most. India doesn't have policy and they went up too. It didn't seem to change, but how about this one? This is, who's the green and who's the white? Who went up 42 and who went down 42? The EU went up and the US went down. Now you probably didn't read that in the New York Times. Okay. How could that be? How did the EU increase emissions and the US reduce emissions? Well, it has to do with things like this, you know. <laughs> you got to know which end of the chainsaw you're. All right, I saw it. Too much pain. Um, I'll tell you one thing the EU doesn't count as part of their emissions is biomass. So that's not even in the 42. They say in their effort to be green, CO2 emissions, they say when I combust wood to make electricity, it makes emissions which are captured by the trees that I cut down and burn again. So it's a nice virtuous cycle. What do you think about that? that you know, you got to look, <laughs> you got to look a little closer. <laughs> How many are getting on that plane? Uh, eh, I'll fly you there. What are we going to look closer at? Well, everything else. What has to happen in the full cycle of anything energy? You have to cut down the trees, you got to make wood residues, you got to move those, you got to make the pellets with glue, move them on boats and trains to boats, trains, boats, burn across. And that doesn't even account for if you weren't cutting down the trees, there's a forest or plants that could grow there and actually sequester CO2 for good and it doesn't account for how long does it take to grow these? How fast do I burn them? There's just so much missing there. Yet, the EU says, here's our renewables. Two thirds of it is biomass. So that's the part that was the 42 million. And I'm not busting the EU, yeah I am. But, you know, intentions and knowledge and what we're really doing so we can have the cost wiki, cost of sustainable energy sources have decreased immensely throughout the years and continue to fall. And I've talked to you about the cost of solar panels and turbines are coming down, but what about the full cost? So these are the, these are the countries that have the, a lot of renewable energy in their mix. If I get rid of the hydro, which is a bunch of it, I'm left with geothermal, wind, solar, and biomass. Some have geothermal, get rid of the biomass we just talked about. Here's the wind and solar, the white or the European Germany has a lot of wind and solar. They're a green thinking economy. What's happened there? This is a good test case for intentions and outcomes. Germany said back in 85, we're going to put in nuclear and they were growing it quickly and they had natural gas as well, growing quickly till about five or six, 2007, somewhere in here. And then Fukushima Daiichi happened and people got worried about fracking. The coal was coming down, but then it flattened. Now, they aren't consuming 
a flat electricity demand, so the rest that they grew was wind. Germany's added a lot of wind, like Texas. So that makes up some of the demand. What do you think the CO2 did with this mix? Nuclear zero emissions, capped it. Natural gas, a lot less than coal. Wind, not, no emissions. But it's intermittent, so you gotta back it up. CO2 was coming down nicely, and then right here, it went flat. That wedge of emissions happened with this good intention, but negative outcome of emissions. They were on a better path pre this. And not only did that go up, the price went up. The price that Germans pay for electricity went up, not for a turbine or a panel, but the full cycle costs. Because you have to back it up, you have to have plants that are redundant, you gotta move it to where it's consumed. There's a lot of things that go into the cost of electricity. So when you start looking at some of these countries and states with bigger renewables, it's more expensive. Which would be okay, the Germans don't mind paying that, but the emissions flattened out, which has seemed okay, oops. So intentions were good. These guys had good intentions. They were putting in these posts to keep people from parking next to the building. You know, they, they kind of <laughs> for, forgot where they parked. And, and governments do that too. They forget where they park and they have no way out. They just keep doubling down because nobody's willing to admit that. The price of electricity on the left is a third or a quarter of these on the right when you throw it all in, okay? When you have energy that's affordable and reliable, you're gonna use it. We gotta figure out how to clean it up. The full cost rule is not less than concentrated centralized electricity. It's just not when you put all the costs in there. So when you hear these things, listen carefully. Yes, it's going up steeply. Yes, the cost per unit of things are coming down, which is great, so it's getting better. But there's other costs. Okay. How did the US do it? How did we come down 42? Well, we doubled our gas, cut our coal way back, grew our renewables. Here's the emissions from coal, which came way down, two thirds, Natural gas is a third of the emissions, and then everything else, renewables and nuclear, no, they don't emit, essentially, and they're a third of our electricity. Because there's our electricity generation, was tracking it, and then when gas started to replace coal, it separated. So we get the power with lower emissions. Why do I show you 2005 and 2015? This was the Paris Accords. Remember we pulled out? We're bad. Bad, bad, bad. Okay. What was our base year for the Paris Accords, the US base year? We're gonna compare against this year, 2005. Why? It's the highest year. It looked good. I know this is true because I knew the Secretary of Energy then. Okay. Everybody set their own base year. Every country set their own base year to compare against. What was our target? 32% reduction by 2030. 1,600 million metric tons down from 2,400. Oops, when it was when the cord was supposed to be signed, we were already at 1,900. We were two-thirds of the way there and going lower with straight lineology. <laughs> okay, 1,400? I mean, where are we now? 2018, we're at 1930. We've gotten four billion tons out of our stream. We can do better. We did it with shale gas. Made it cheap, replaced coal. Some renewable policy, coal pressure, and the good old shale game moving demand around. We've reduced CO2 emissions faster than any nation on Earth that's of any size. Did you know that? We should, why aren't we celebrating that? Rhetorical question, why aren't we celebrating that? We can do better, but why aren't we celebrating that? Because it wasn't done with what? federal policy, taxes. What do politicians love besides votes? Taxes. <laughs> okay. Listen carefully when you're listening to the discussions about what works for actual CO2 emissions reductions. 
not increasing taxes, now we know what works for that, not getting new votes, we know what works for that, creating angst and dialogue and rancor among the voters. You guys have these? Sit outside, a little chilly at night, burn your propane, heat up the atmosphere directly. <laughs> it's awesome, right? <laughs> really green. You know, I took this picture in Aspen, Colorado, because they're really green thinkers. And you can tell how green thinking they are because you see they say it <laughs> right there. You know, no global warming. Remember my dilemma? We don't know how electricity is made and where gasoline comes from. Oil and natural gas are up in the, the United States because of fracking. Imports are cut in half. Our demand has been flat. Jimmy Carter was president in 73. I was learning how to drive that yellow bug. If we had keep, kept increasing energy the way we were, it would be that red line. That huge wedge there, let's call that efficiency. It's the energy we're not consuming. We can do better. I'm going to say that over. We can do better, but that's not bad. It's way more than fracking. It's way more than renewables. And the world could follow that. We had this cool contest down in Austin for energy efficiency. <laughs> the, uh, the house on the right won. <laughs> the, the ditto house. We look for it every year. So here's the result of this on a big scale. The Asia Pacific had a coal to gas ratio for power of 3x, and they weren't consuming much of either. 32 years later, 10x, or sorry, 5x coal to gas, and 10 times the amount of coal. What did we do? We had a ratio of 5x in 85, but we've gone a completely different direction. Our coal to gas is now 0.9x, eight times the amount of gas replacing coal. And that's what's driven the emissions down. It's not perfect. We could capture those emissions, but it's had a remarkable impact on our emissions. So you see here now China, 15% renewables and natural gas, almost 70% coal. We're 45, 16% coal. Who's the player here that matters though? India. They're just starting. The cars, two and a half million, not 27. Electricity, coal, some renewables. Where could they head? Nuclear, natural gas renewables. Some reasonable mix would be phenomenal. Can we reduce CO2 emissions at the scale in the time frames the climate models themselves say is needed? How do we do it? Well, here's some things. These are the things I think actually would work. Okay? Centralize natural gas with carbon capture, especially for urban and rural. Natural gas replacing coal. Centralized nuclear. It matters. Nuclear is dense. It's efficient. There's no emissions, both urban, mostly urban. Geothermal, where you have it. Not everybody does. Hydro, where you have it. Not everybody does. Centralized wind. Germany has some. Texas, there are places, yeah, a lot of wind. You've got to back it up with something. Distributed renewables to, to the rural areas. I mean, there aren't any roads, there's no pipes, there's no wires, there's nothing to these people that we vi are visiting. They have to start with distributed renewable energy, solar panels for the most part, picohydro, other things, small modular reactors in some of the villages and towns, nuclear, natural gas, to back up the renewables, coal with capture, and phase out. You got to get countries turning around, China is just starting to roll over. We're going to, I'm going to Vietnam Wednesday for filming, and they're announcing they're going to build their economy on coal, just like the rest of us did. So how do you get them to think about natural gas, nuclear, and other st strategies? <laughs> if electric vehicles in the urban areas, sure, plug them in, drive your 30 miles to work, drive home. Fuel cells, natural gas, and then efficiency, massive. Some mix, and, and nothing's perfect, and one size doesn't fit all. Some mix of these things at scale could do it in the time frames and the amounts that we need. So let's kind of come to these last sustainable truths. I've been talking a lot about energy, the environment, the economy, and the social political structures that wrap all of that together. It's complicated. These are interactive systems in the energy world. 
It's very political because it underpins everything we do. Environment is carbon and climate change and fracking. The economy is poverty and healthy economies and energy. You'll hear climate change is the most important issue of the time and fossil fuels are the problem. And it's true. We combust fossil fuels, they make CO2 emissions. You'll hear that poverty is a major issue, fossil fuels are the solution. It's true. You can't come out of poverty without large scale energy. Coal, natural gas, nuclear, petroleum have done that and will continue to do that. I call it the radical middle because it's lonely. You know, there's nobody there. You got to come in and be willing to compromise and use data and look at graphs and have, you know, have facts interrupt your beliefs. It's awful <laughs> to be there in that radical middle. But energy is the star of this. And so let's look at the reality of the environmental impact of oil and gas. It's huge. It always has been. It's getting better. The f everything about it, mining, drilling, water handling, transporting, refining, combusting, has environmental impact. And we do it at a massive scale to, to fire the engine of this world. Okay? Water, talk about Purdue, out of Midland Basin. This is in billions of barrels. You got to handle that, recycle, reuse it, or dispose it. You make more water than oil, more water than energy from gas. Oil business always has. When you put a lot of that away, you know here in Oklahoma, and we know in Texas, what happens when you dispose it? These are the magnitude three earthquakes in Texas now. Look what the trend that Dallas was on and what happened. Here's the trend that the Eagle Ford was on. Here's West Texas. And then boom, we, built, we have TexNet. I mean, my organization has the Texas seismometer network. We put it in place in the last four years. We know where they are and how they're, when they're happening. We're working on cause. So industry needs to clean up. You know, when you, when you have water issues and fracking and methane and flaring and earthquakes, even in West Texas, when the ground's shaking, there's nobody happy. They're worried. They're, you know, they feel like this person. <laughs> You're in the running of the bulls, you know. And this is the winner of the last photo taken contest. <laughs> so, I'm going to show you the runner up. Here we go. Hold on. But how worried are we? Here's the Marcellus out in the east. That's the basin. Here's the, all the wells. What's that? Is it a shale basin? What's that line? Did I just not plot the wells? That's New York. Yeah. New York has a moratorium on drilling. You can't own your own, you can't get your own property. Okay? They own the gas. The citizens in this country own our gas or our oil. They won't let them have it, no eminent domain. That's a good case study for the law school, Mr. Dean. <laughs> yeah, it'd be interesting to do that, right? So green energy is energy that can be extracted, generated, and consumed without any significant negative impact on the environment. That's the definition of green energy in the Wikipedia. Quote. So, and they say green is solar and wind. And so here's, here's no impact. And what's it take to do that? I mean, obviously the land is impacted, but we're going to have impact with oil and gas. I just talked about all of it. Well, you got to get the metals and the glass from somewhere. The turbines for the copper and the metals, mining, manufacturing, these are big, simple machines. The wind and the sun are not dense. It takes a lot of stuff. Got to produce them, transmit it <coughs> with power lines to where it's needed. And then what do we do with all of it? What do we do with those turbines and those panels and the batteries when they wear out? Because they do. We're starting to cut them up and put them in landfills. And some will probably ship to other countries so they can put them in their landfills. Just like we're doing with our CO2 emissions because it'll be cheaper to do it there. So is that green? Is mining, you think mining's green? I like mining, we need it. But we've got to be honest about good and bad, clean and dirty. The sun and the wind are renewable. The stuff to collect them is not. Let me say that again. There's nothing renewable about solar panels and wind turbines. 
are batteries. Okay? Contrary to what we wish were the case. Runner up, last photo taken contest. <laughs> hey, look what I got, you know. All right. So all forms of energy at scale have environmental impacts. The hard truths, fossil fuels impact the environment. Clean them up. Industry, clean it up. You can do this if you want a public license to operate. Carbon pricing doesn't reduce emissions, it increases taxes. So some people like them, it passed through to the cost of makes them less competitive. We send the manufacturing overseas where their controls are less than ours. Okay, one atmosphere, just one atmosphere. Zero emissions is political, it's not real. I mean, unless you don't use power or fuel or clothing or cell phones or homes or cars, or, somebody makes that stuff. One atmosphere, one earth. Sun and wind are renewable, the panels and the turbines are not. Got to do a lot of things. Renewable energy won't address climate change. We just can't get it there fast enough. Not even close. Renewable energy isn't green. It just shifts the impact. Okay. Poverty, hard truths, energy, centralized distribute, fossil and renewable, it's all needed to address this major issue of energy poverty, which has an effect on all of us. One third of the world is not sustainable. It's not even right. Energy won't end poverty, but you can't end poverty without energy. So one final truth is it's solvable. And along the way, I've been showing you things that I think will work. The transition to massively reduce energy poverty is doable in a few decades. Minimize the impacts, that's doable. There are going to be impacts, but we've got to make them smart. And to flatten and decrease atmospheric emissions, it's doable. Renewables will help. You've got to have nuclear, you've got to have natural gas replacing coal, we've got to have more efficiency, carbon capture, the big things at scale that matter. And it requires education. To do this is going to require nonpartisan education and all of you in all your social circles getting out there and talking about it. Who are the educators? This is Rex Tillerson. He was our Secretary of State. He ran Exxon for a while. He knows a thing or two about energy. That's Ernie Moniz. Ernie was Secretary of Energy under Mr. Obama, brilliant physicist, MIT. Here's our current Secretary of Energy, our former governor down in Texas, Mr. Perry. And then this person you may not know, Al Nimi, he ran OPEC. He ran Saudi Aramco, Secretary of Energy for Saudi Arabia. Why, I'm, why am I showing you all these guys? I just wanted you to know I'm important. And uh, I know a lot of important people. Okay. Uh, really, it's because it's not Rex, it's Matt Damon, okay? And that really isn't Ernie, it's Leo. Leo DiCaprio. Students are starting to wiggle. Who's that? Oh, it's Mark Ruffalo, the Hulk. And I got to do this, I apologize, but who's that? Okay, it is, it's AOC, you know, all right. <laughs> Why am I showing you them? Do we base our actions and our votes on data and, and, and facts? What do we run on? What do humans run on? Emotions. These are the emotive leaders. If Leo was here today talking about energy like he does to the UN, you probably couldn't keep the students out of here, right? like me lecturing about acting. <laughs> I made a film. I know a lot. I know nothing <laughs> about acting. And what are they saying? What are they telling the world, these emotive leaders? They're saying that, can you see through here at night? This is a Landsat at night where the electricity is, where all the lights are on. I'm not advocating lights on at night. Silly. But there they are. You can see why they're on now, right? Where and why? They have energy. Look where they're not on and who doesn't have energy. Green New Deal, it's just a name for something that's always existed. It's a, it's a, it's a concept to keep the oil and the gas and the coal in the ground and probably the nuclear. 
So that would be 85% of the world's energy going away. If we had dimmer lights up here, which I don't think I can do, I could probably cause a blackout though. Do not use. <laughs> Does not work, do not use, okay. And I can read. Watch what happens when you dim the earth by 85%. The lights are going down and when it's really dark, you can see that happen. What happens is you start to keep people in poverty. You go in the wrong direction from what the demand actually is. Better to lift, turn the lights back on. Watch Africa. Just watch up here as a, as a thought experiment. What would happen if we were to light up Africa? <coughs> Think about the issues, the education, medical, healthcare, rights and freedom of women, birth rates, immigration, migration. I'm just using Africa as an example of energy poverty. Think what happens if we start to do that and do it well. It changes the world. Okay? Changes the environment because healthy economies can now invest in the environment as you've seen it just in my pictures. Energy, these are things that are linked. You can't separate them. Energy, the economy, the environment, the scale of demand is unfathomable and it's growing. Impossible to really understand how much energy we consume. Fossil resources are vast and they're needed. Renewables are growing and they're needed. No form of energy is without an impact. There's nothing good or bad, clean or dirty, just different at scale. The positive effects are lost in the rhetoric, especially in the West. We talk about all the downsides of energy and not all the upsides, which is everything we enjoy is because of energy. We need the education. Nonpartisan education is critical to addressing this. So here's, here's our three circles. And are we going to continue to pull ourselves apart or are we going to pull ourselves together? Particularly for the folks in this room that are early in their careers. Are we going to create that radical middle that allows for that kind of change based on data and facts? That's what we're doing at Switch. Switch on uh, our next film and all of our videos and things is trying to provide nonpartisan materials to high schools, to colleges, to policymakers, to professionals, free, so you can use them. And, and that's, what, that's my night job, but you can check me out on Instagram. We're heading to Vietnam this week and everything else. So uh, thanks for your attention and hopefully we have time for some questions. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know. You know, so I try to, if I don't know, I'm going to tell you, this is my opinion. <laughs> so I don't have any graphs for this. But we'll probably continue to see some polarization in the developed world, Western Europe here, other parts, just because that's the narrative today. That's the dialogue that's been created, and it's hard to deconstruct that and put it back together in a real way. It's gonna take the young people doing it. You know, young folks are gonna to have to get out there on social media. I mean, if you went online right now and said, I love oil and gas, you probably would just get clobbered, okay, right? I see people laughing, this is what would happen. But, you know, instead of saying, maybe your answer, if you say, I'm going into the oil and gas business and say, you're killing the earth, how could you do that, you're evil. You say, actually, I'm going into an industry that's working to lift the world out of poverty. What do you do? There'd, there'd be a conversation starter. 
you know, they might have to pause before they attack again and think for a second, oh yeah, maybe energy does do something good. So here in the West, we got to put it back together. The rest of the world, though, pretty passionate about energy, and they don't look at bad and good. They look at having some energy as good, and they're starting to grow and industrialize, and that's most of the world. So we can leave ourselves polarizing in the wings, but I can promise you China is laughing hysterically. And I've been in over 60 countries, and China's present in almost every one of them in a big way. Investing, building, citizenship, acquiring minerals, globally. So we can talk about it and continue to do the little things we're doing while the rest of the world just moves forward. Or we can help. We can be part of that real conversation so they do it in a way that makes more sense for the environment and the global economy. And that's what I hope happens. That's why I'm pushed into this kind of thing at 60 years old. You know, that's what I'm trying to actually do is to give the tools to allow that to happen. I'm from West Texas, and uh, I couldn't tell. <laughs> <laughs> I love oil and gas, and the reason why I do is when I was in Haiti, I saw real poverty. Yeah, and I saw running out of the food that I was trying to give the poor just vaporized right before my eyes. Yep. I challenge everyone in this world to get us to the oil country. You got the money that you got here in this country. You got the money to give it to the world country. And what I advocate as far as the oil and gas industry, as far as politics is concerned, I wholeheartedly believe that we need to repatriate the Lamco and Pemex. That will be $36 trillion, and you certainly can do the good that you want to do with that kind of money. <laughs> well, up until the last part, <laughs> I completely understand what you're saying. And Haiti is one of the worst. You know especially after the big storms and earthquakes and hurricanes and things. It's just, it's like a post-war zone over there. And energy matters completely to them. As far as repatriating, you know, Aramco and Pemex, that's a, that's a different scene. Um, Aramco is looking to have a public offering for 5% of its company now. Their valuation is going to be interesting, pretty high. Pemex, unfortunately, you know, we've been working in Mexico for the last several years now as they change their constitution. Some good things were going, but the election of AMLO down there has redirected that progress. And many of the companies that were pushed in to invest into Mexico, now that they're putting, they're stalling their offshore bids and other things are going other places. They can't wait to, for the number of years it's going to take. So a lot of people are concerned that Mexico is going to follow Venezuela's footsteps now with, with the nationalistic leadership that AMLO brings. And I understand why he was elected. We don't agree with it, but I understand why. But the impacts of that are going to be very real. Mike Harris, I have a quick question. Um, you're, I, hate, I think some people agree you're preaching the choir here. Have you had the opportunity to give this presentation to a maybe non as receptive audience? Yeah. And if so, what was the outcome of that? Sure. No, I speak all over the world. Uh, I've given close to 800 talks like this in 60 countries. And when Switch came out, I, the 20 universities I chose were Berkeley, uh, Michigan, University of Colorado, Stanford, MIT, and I could go on with the list. I didn't go to A&M, I didn't go to OU, I went to OU for other reasons, and I've lectured those places, but not for that. So yes, I do that, um, and I don't change my message. What usually happens is young people in the room come up to me and they say, my head hurts, Everything I thought I believed, you've now disrupted, but it looks like you were referencing data. <laughs> I've got to go look into it. Can you share your graphs? Yes, they're online. And then the next thing is, I'm angry. I'm pretty tweaked off that I don't, why haven't I seen this before? And I ask them where they get their information about energy. Well, my social media feeds. I'm not being sarcastic. You know, and what are those feeds? Well, this, this, and this. Oh, they agree with you completely. So you're, you're confirming your own biases. Yep. 
But everybody agrees with me, and we all do this, by the way, that's not young people, that's all of us, confirm our own biases. So they're angry that they haven't heard that. Then they say, what can I do to get involved? How can I be part of this? A few don't, a lot do. I say, start learning, go online. We got 300 short format videos you can watch for free. Get yourself up to speed, start speaking, take the risks, talk to your social groups, civic groups, scout groups, church groups. I provide all my slides, mix and match, <coughs> engage. This conversation has to be owned by people who have some understanding of, of what we're talking about. And I bet I'm not preaching to the choir completely here. I bet I've disrupted some thinking. How many in the room resemble what I just described? And don't be shy. A little angry, a little disrupted by some of the things I showed today. Anybody? Okay, great. There's half a dozen, dozen hands up. And I might, I, look, I'm not right. Okay. You can, everybody can look at data differently. But I just encourage you to dive deeper than the narrative. Because that narrative is owned for a reason by people who are vested in its outcomes. And those outcomes aren't necessarily to reduce CO2 emissions. Okay? Those outcomes are going to have different set of things. Just look at Germany. Look at the US, look at the EU, look at China, look at India and other places in the world. What's actually happening? Intentions and outcomes are so important. So that's what I try to do with everyone is encourage that. And yeah, I've given it in Europe, I've given it in Germany, it doesn't matter. I kind of like that engagement, but I do have Kevlar. <laughs> Thanks for your attention today and good luck.